領域展開福間水氏 Hello guys, it's been a hundred hours already. I think it's time to finally release the video. Today you'll learn how to become ridiculously strong, one shotting all bosses starting from the very first dragon to the last, acquire several fast travel crystals right in the first hour of the game, find all the best merchants and level up relationships with them without failing a single quest due to clumsy speedrunning, which many players have already done after watching several videos with initial tips from people who haven't even completed the game once. You can use advices from this guide at any point of the game, whether at the very beginning, as soon as you land from the griffin, or later during your journey around the 17th hour. As you can see, for better navigation, I added the time cuts. In the first part of the video, we'll simply make the dogma more quality of life comfortable, while in the second part, there will be complete destruction of everything using the strongest vocation in terms of damage, the magic archer. In Dogma 1, this class was already already unbalanced, surpassing all other classes in everything. In this part, the other classes been improved, but the gap in damage aspect with the magic archer still remains, even compared to sorcerers with their meteors, that requires incredibly long casting and setup to deal about 5 times less damage than the archer does in an incomparably shorter time. Cause in Dogma there is no infinite stamina while exploring, and you don't have the roach, I recommend you to make main character as tall as possible, simply cause tall characters run faster. Also, if you want to make your pawn melee based, it's better to make it tall too. I prefer to start the game as a mage only because in Dogma, stats are distributed during the level up depending on the character's vocation, and I don't want to receive strength when I'm supposed to be magic archer. But considering this new info, in Dogma 2 all vocations anyway get identical stats near level 200, so that's not that important. In Malf, if you bought the port crew crystal microtransaction DLC, you can immediately place a fast travel spot. If not, well, gates to the open world are open, and I'm leaving Gregor to his goblins. I'll be back from the milk store when become OP. First, what we need is to visit the nameless village, probably the first place for every fast build strategy, cause upon visiting you immediately receive a high damage skill for a thief that only can be used combined with the next one. After you descend into the cave and pass a trial for a three year old, so you open a vulnerability skill, formless faint. Only because of this skill we swap into thief vocation. When faint is active, you cannot receive damage, except from falling and this tentacle damage from two bosses in post game in exchange for invulnerability the character's stamina is consuming. We'll solve this problem soon, but even right now I think you understand that Formless Faint allows you to easily get into any place on the map you desire, and you probably desire to unlock fast travel. How convenient that three port crystals located almost in the same location, one in Griffin's Nest here on the map. As you can see, it's pretty close to this single bridge through which you can enter this part of the kingdom. As soon as you see this lives, consider you already have fast travel. Jump off the left side, pick up the crystal, fairy stone and a bunch of gold lying in the nest. Even if Griffin is here, there is won't be any problems to loot all of this. Then uh, the dark forest, which the road from the nest leads to. It's an unpleasant location. Understanding where to go in the pitch darkness is pretty hard, but here's a point on the map that you need to follow. The main thing is to reach the zombie village along the way. After that, you go here, see another cliffs, just climb on them and leave Dark Forest behind. Also, don't forget to time to time disable Formless Faint if there are no enemies nearby to avoid wasting stamina. And don't be stingy with consumables, we'll have a plenty of them soon, so there is no point in holding on to them. When you climb up the cliffs, check that you have at least one pawn alive by this point. On the top, turn right and you see a campfire and a giant ladder. That's the place. If Harp is still chasing you near Sphinx, just kill them or go to near cave to remove Agra. As things, for now you only need to complete the Riddle of Madness and the Riddle of Conviction. First, uh, Riddle of Madness. Just bring all your pawns to the pedestal and the second port crystal is yours. Riddle of Conviction. Here you just show her a port crystal, so she can duplicate it in chest. Also, if you show her any other item, Sphinx duplicate it as well. But in my opinion, port crystal is the best option. So, after receiving in total three fast travel marks, we need to head to Batal. That's the entrance. You can descend there however you like, through the forest or through the door in the mountains. If you see a dragon, 
that's the right spot. Place one of your port crystals here, just in case for the future you can pick up this crystal at any time. Cast Formless Faint and speed run through this passage, filled with green goblins. If you've came here without Formless Faint skill, you'd suffer just like I did in the first stream on the day the game was released. <clears throat> Let the stamina restore before the bridge, run past it, just don't press sprint. You cover a much greater distance in Formless Faint while just running. Sprint only when you are not in faint and sure that's no one near you. Like here, place where sits these three goblins. Here you can sprint until you reach the golem. Out of the golem's boss arena, you'll have the opportunity to save. Here... <sighs> Don't go left. There are owls. You don't want to mess with them. Just go forward until you reach the bandit camp in the village. After that, there will be a bridge. Turn left, run a little, turn right, and after a long climb on a crag, you'll get to the city. Deposit all useless items at this tavern. Place here a port crystal. Go to the market and buy a fire stone. You need two of them in the inventory for money making. One you already looted from Griffin's Nest. Uh, that's uh, the second. The most effective non-fighting farming strategy in this game is to have a port crystal in mouth and one somewhere in battle. With that, you just use climate differences to your advantage. Look, when you buy fruits in mouth, they cost around 50 gold. When you sell them in sandy battle, they cost 170 gold. And if you sell ripened versions of fruits, they cost even more. Fruits become ripened after two days in your inventory. If you bought the microtransaction, you already have a crystal in mouth. If not, just use one of your two fairy stones to get to that port crystal near the dragon. Take it in your inventory and run this marathon to Malph. If you're not me and already unlocked Burnworth, you can go to Malph using that ox card. Okay, when you have all the crystals set, the farming process looks like this. You buy grapes and apples from this guy, sit on a bench, wait here a day, buy fruits again. When 10 ripened grapes and apples accumulate in your inventory, send them to your stock in a nearby tavern. Continue that until you run out of money. 8000 gold would be enough for initial investment for a start. After spending all the money and filling your stock with ripened fruits, teleport to Batal, take all the stuff from the tavern and sell it to this guy. After you sell it, buy two fairy stones. He has only one fairy stone in stock, so after buying, wait three days at this bench and buy the second one. Also, don't forget to buy as many stamina restoring pills from him as you can. With Harspot Reverence, you can easily run long distances without turning off invulnerability, just restoring your stamina either by fast usage or via inventory. Unbalanced stuff, you know especially on some pure thief build. So, after acquiring two fairy stones, you can make another Melv Battle Road for even more money. But I think it's better to not overdo it. You'll need only 70,000 gold in total. Um, by the way, some players might have a problem with this strat if they have Logistician Pawn in their party. If you've seen this icon on the right part of the screen, feed the pawn that causing this to the water. At Battle, you can buy Noon Blooms and Sun Blooms from this cat girl. Combining these two will give you a bunch of flowers which can improve relations with some characters that have this and these traits at their info. This way, gifting around two or three flowers to the stamina pills guy gives you a 5% discount. If you don't have a discount with the mouth vendor, you can give him some flowers too. Only don't gift all flowers at once. Give a character one bunch, then wait a day, then give it again. This way you won't waste extra flowers. Through the whole game, you'll need about 10 more flowers, so you can buy it now. By the way, I hope you collect at 70,000 gold to spare, because with our remaining port crystal we're coming to acquire the best pre-eclipse gear in the game. You can buy it at the volcanic island, and no, you can't go through here. There's a giant locked door, so we must go a long way through the south. Should I explain something? Um, just turn on invulnerability and walk through the enemies along the way, hitting Harsput Reverence. I advise not to deviate from the road and follow the map. At some point, after goblins, there will be owls. If you didn't have Reverence and Formless Faint at this moment, you'd only be able to pass here at around the 40th attempt. Yes, that's exactly how many times I died here on the first run, when I didn't know about the Nameless Village existing. Actually, if you think about it, it would be so cool to be a big YouTuber, receiving press releases. God, if I had the opportunity to play the game in advance, I could have made this video right in the release day. As you can see, after a bandit camp, we end up in a dungeon. Of course, you might get lost here, but if you stuck to the left hand, I'm sure everything will be nice. If you see a cyclops, it's the right way. I jump over the pillar to the chest, and here you can catch your breath. Then go right, break the pile of rocks, descend, run a little, and finally we're in the desired location. A little more running forward 
forward, and here's the city. On my playthrough, I wasted around 8 Harspot Reverence. Next time I visit Bagbatal, I'll buy more. Why did we even run to this camp? To play support crystal here, and also for this cat girl, selling the best equipment for any class, and two fairy stones. Immediately give her flowers, skipping days, until you get 10% discount. Just look at her cheeks, god, if she kicked me in the stomach and forced me to lick her hairy legs. So, now we have three port crystals placed at the best game locations, around 70,000 gold to buy the most expensive weapon for each class, and a trader who can sell it with the one who sells rare stamina restoring consumables. Time to move on to the second part of the guide. The one-shot arc begins. If you already visited Wernworth, you probably met this old man. I'm not, so I had to return to Gregor and finally accompany him to the capital. Back to the dwarf, give him some grass. Accompany his dusty majesty to the house, talk a little, agree to take him to the city, use a fairy stone to go there, or if you wish to suffer, you can run there by yourself. Before going up to the hot springs, uh, swap your vocation to a sorcerer or a mage, because, you know, that's high level quest and you get a ton of XP for that. And it's better that these levels you gain go into magic damage and not in strength. Dwarf's wife just teaches you the magic archer vocation. After talking to her again, you get a scroll. Change your vocation, read a scroll, and now you have a martyr's bolt. It converts your health to damage. I'll tell you right away that scaling goes in percentages, not flat numbers, meaning that by wearing some rings that boost your HP, you won't charge your attack longer. And as, as far as I know, you won't deal more damage either. Uh, by the way, don't forget you can restore health not only at camps or taverns, but with all heal potions and wake stones. They are pretty rare, but the fact that with their help you can cast a fully charged martyr strike multiple times in a fight is quite interesting in itself. Best skills for this vacation, after Martyr's Bolt of course, is Frost Arrows for freezing enemies. It's also have a nice DPS in long battles, cause arrows do not disappear immediately and damage enemies after the first hit for about 5 seconds. Next, Ricochet Arrows. Obviously maximum efficiency it shows in enclosed spaces like a caves, buildings. Damage of these arrows in such conditions is comparable even with the Martyr's Strike, but without having to waste your health. Last skill, you can pick by yourself. Such a tight avalanche is cool for its burst damage, and big part of the game I played with it. Especially satisfying is when you release all this gravitation magic into some armored enemy and send him flying with one blow. But we all know what skill will be your favorite. Hoog. You know, in Second Dragon's Dogma there is no such thing as Fireball and Mage Arsenal. If you want to cast AoE spell, you forced to use either long casting meteors or some little stream of fire. Thanks goodness Magic Archer doesn't have such problems. Blaze Fang Arrow does a great job in clearing low tier trash like goblins and all of that. At the same time, it's easily killing hairy, vulnerable to fire bosses. Of course, against some fire dragons that have resistance, Flame Arrow is useless compared to Avalanche that has a really high damage. But let's be clear, Frost Arrows long term deal more damage even than Sagittate, so only advantage of uh, Spaghetti Avalanche is clearing some little fire immune salamandras. When speaking of Blaze Fang Arrow, it has big advantage in the post game. Every boss there has a mechanic of weak points, after the destruction of which it gains an vulnerability, until new weak point opens up. Obviously, you don't want to spend health on this using Martyr's Bolt, cause this mechanic makes one-shotting impossible. But you can use Fire Arrow, it helps without any problems erase all the post-game bosses. These guys are the strongest in the game, but oops, they don't have fire resistance. And don't forget, if your Fire Arrow already missed, or conversely hits the enemy with certainty, you can exit aiming mod with Cancel Key. And don't forget to set less aim radius with conversion, this allows you to cast your arrows quickly, it's like 2 times DPS boost. I finished the whole game with big radius and didn't even know about this function. Don't repeat my mistakes. <laughs> okay, we talked about skills, so now back to the game. Buy Dragon Breath Bow from a cat girl, and now you can go to elves. Just go to these ruins, jump a little bit, a cave uh, with an ogre inside, and on the left from the cave exit will be the sacred arbor. To understand elvish, make your pawn a proficiency by gifting some bunches of flowers to elven town keeper. As always, gift one flower, go to the bench, skip 
say, repeat. At some point, she gives you a scroll that lets your pawn understand Brehish. With that, you can easily grade your bow one time and buy two magic damage rings from this granny. So, I think the gear we have is pretty enough for the rest of the game. Even in sufficiently difficult Eclipse segment, uh, the build, even in current state, will perform excellently. And by the way, regarding the main quest, and that's precisely why I left Gregor on the path to the capital. For some reason, after the character's visit to Oneworth, a time limit is imposed on you, during which you must fastly complete Skelly Invader's quest, along with the Monster Culling quest from Brent. If you don't do this within a certain time period, the quest related to Ulrika, leading to a romance with her, simply becomes unavailable, and the Drake attacking Malf just won't spawn. I have no idea why this quest is tied to time, keeping in mind that Ulrika is like the main romance girl in the second dogma. I understand it's a strange comparison, considering the differences in the importance of the plot in these games, but it's like if in The Witcher devs gave you a limit of 13 game days to come to Skellig, otherwise Yennefer's quest just disappears, and she becomes an average background NPC on the location, with whom you can't even start a dialogue. And this is exactly what Ulrika became on my first playthrough. Okay, enough crying. I haven't talked about pawns yet. By default, any party must include a mage with Celestial Peen and Palladium, and a sorcerer with Maelstrom and Meteors. The third pawn allows some thinking space, because it's advisable to pick it according to your build. I'll say straight away that in the game there are only two effective builds. The first one is the Magic Archer, and the second one is the Invulnerable Thief. We are stamina stacking. Maybe I'll make a video about this build soon. For a thief, you want enemies to hit you, so for a third pawn you can either take a second mage or a sorcerer. But we're playing Magic Archer, and for us it's important to have a tank that aggress enemies. This can be any melee vacation. A pawn just need to have either provocation augment or a ring of disfavor, or both. A tank pawn may be a thief with this set of skills and these augments. This pawn will be most effective in killing bosses with weak points, cause thief has the biggest DPS while climbing. But problem hits with pawn's AI. Thief pawn don't use formless faint most of the time, don't want to run to the thick of battle, even if he's invulnerable right now. So only cause of stupidity of AI in this game, thief pawn is not an ideal option. Same goes with fighter. Yeah, this class have a really cool mastery attack, but when fighting against giant enemies, for some reason fighter pawn just stays AFK blocking. Or it starts to climb enemies, which is even worse, cause when character is climbing, enemy most of the times loses aggro on it and starts attacking someone else. I'm not saying that fighter pawn can miss his mastery attack, cause one-handed weapons is pretty short. I can say that fighters is best against default enemies such as these armored rattlers, one of the most annoying enemies in my opinion. For example, warrior pawns can't kill them with one combination, but when it comes to bosses, I think this vacation has the best AI for the pawns. Yeah, I can say that warriors has objectively less DPS than the thieves, but they have a higher knockdown damage and resistance to it too. As you can see in the pretty good armor, my warrior pawn literally tongue dragons landing and without staggering just kills it. And I can say overall that Warrior is the best vocation for a tank. Look for a warrior pawns with this setup of attacks, these segments, and with maximum 2 meters, 15 centimeters height. Like my Muriel. Her ID is on the screen, by the way. Best jewelry for warrior pawns is Rings of Valhemans, that you can buy from the same merchant in Volcanic Island. So, this is how the best pawn setup for Magic Archer looks like. What's next? I think it's time to collect all the remaining port crystals. Easiest from all crystals to acquire is from Dragonforged. But only after you slain one or two dragons and have 20 worms life crystals to trade. I recommend to place purchased crystal near the entrance to the cave. Dragonforged is pretty useful NPC. Fifth crystal you get by completing a quest from this elf in Vernworth. You don't need to fight anyone here, the only thing you need is to run a lot. Buy a human bow for the elf, shoot with him in the forest, then return to the city, find the elf again in the square, and go with him to the elven harbor, then save his sister from an ogre. Killing ogre is not necessary, you can just take his sister and run out of the cave. At the exit, talk to elf's father, and he will give you what you need. Sixth crystal you get in the main quest, from Brunt, when it's time to depart to Batal Desert. The whole main quest is like fighting with two goblins around Wernworth and nearby villages three times, and then walk around the city listening dialogues. Only finding a library in slums is pretty stuffy. You needed to free this dude from the cells. Aside from that, 
said, there's nothing difficult. So don't be lazy to listen to some verbiage from Preston Garvey for one port crystal. It doesn't fail any side quests if you're worried about that. More you can get only once per new game plus by duplicating crystals at Sphinx Riddles. Or considering that half of the players already downloaded thousands of cheat modes, allowing to buy 900 crystals for one gold, you can get it randomly as a gift to your pawn. Especially if you're a streamer, YouTuber or just some high rating pawn creator, you can count that time to time you'll receive these unique items. Best thing you can get from another world is golden bugs. You know, game allows to play only 10 fast travel spots, but with bugs you can eat infinite numbers. Ok, with this amount of fast travel spots you can start farm gold incredibly fast by killing golems and drakes. Loot they drop, like medals, worms life currency, costs like a factory new lambo. On the map I marked all useful farm locations of these mobs, which is logical, on the volcanic island the density of such opponents is higher, and dragons and golem are located there as close as possible to each other. Alternatively, I can suggest clearing the cave system near Dragonforged. There are several bosses inside, including golem, and when you exit the cave you'll encounter a drake. Also on the map I marked all places where drakes spawn. You can set port crystals there and farm them too. About a uh, fast travel in this game. It's quite an interesting situation. In the first dogma, all the most important things were done in two locations, which had the built-in port crystals. Everything from forging copies of items to buying the best gear, infinite amounts of healing and stamina potions that makes you invincible, everything of that was sold in the main city, while the infinite gold source, equipment enhancement and the best possible min-max gear were in the DLC. That had a built-in rift stone at the entrance too. In the second part, probably to force players to donate for port crystals, all of that was scattered around this gigantic world. Even weapon enhancing was divided into four types. To min-max physical damage, you need to go to Batal. To enhance magic, to the elves. If you're brokey and don't have resources for an upgrade, go to Vernworth, it's cheaper there. And if you want a knockdown damage slash resistance, go to dwarves. Also for weapons that damage both magically and physically, dwarves are better. Thanks at least near the game ending, raiders gather in the same place once again. After farming some dragon's locations, or just farming only one volcanic island, as I prefer to do, you can sit on the bench, doze off to skip 7 days and go your farming road again. This way you can get as much money and XP as you want. If you want it, of course. As I understand from the position of min-maxing, the most effective way to build your character is to speedrun the whole game on the first level, kill all 15 enemies that you'll meet during story quest with your high-level pawns that you can summon from your Steam friend list. There are no restrictions on a pawn's levels when it's your friend. And after starting a new game plus on a low level, you just go to the Dragon Forged, spend 20 Dragon Crystals on a vacation start back and just play the game, only with this buff. With it, every level you'll get, your stat bonus will double. By the way, I think it would be fun to make such perfectionist min maxing game plus run, but not in this lifetime. So if you don't care about speedrunning to new game plus, you'll probably be interested in getting the Ring of Ambition, which amplifies the XP gain of the wearer. Considering that in Dragon's Dogma 2 your character can level up to 999 level, probably it's the best ring in the game. How to get it? You'll have to go back to the Sphinx and finish her quests. For this, go to Harf Village and in local rift take a pawn named Sphinx Parent. Go rest at some tavern to make a checkpoint, place one of your port crystals nearby the Sphinx, and we can start. Riddle of Ice. Just go into the cave nearby and bring the Sphinx ceiling file from this chest. Third trial, Riddle of Wisdom. This is why we recruited a parent pawn in the Harf village. Get him to the pedestal and that's all. The final challenge in this place is to find the location where you first found the Seeker's token. Since I recorded my playthrough, I found this place with Ace. Your location may be different. After bringing token to her, Sphinx just fly away and you'll need to search for it here. You can find this place going from the north side, uh, uh, or alternatively you can just climb onto this girl and fly there. However, you'll need some stamina restoring consumables, because the flight is quite far. Here, as always, you can set a port crystal, save in a tavern, and replenish your supply of fairy stones. And yeah, in this place things riddles are all random, so I'll tell you about them in the order 
they appeared for me. The riddle of differentiation. You'll be asked to bring her an average self-improvement channel subscriber. Hopefully he's already improved his confidence and cold approach skills. Probably even embraced no fab. Maybe in 50 years he'll finally find a girlfriend with that face. This guy is one of two well-known brothers. One is named Dante. He's on the north side of this gate. And the other is named Virgil. He's on the south side of the gates. We need Virgil specifically. Top 10 best mewing transformation. <laughs> Take Buddy Boyo on your shoulder and teleport back to the Sphinx. The next riddle for me, the riddle of futility. You need to take this amphora and deliver it to this dude. Even though I have a port crystal nearby the city where this dude is located, I decided to be cautious and deliver the men to the amphora rather than vice versa. The next riddle is to fight with this knight while wearing a ring that cuts your damage to zero. So all you left to do is attack the knight with maximum knockdown power skill in case of magic card sure it's either ricochet arrows or sagittite avalanche grab him and throw knight off the cliff now just don't forget to remove the ring and loot the chest inside lies the ring of ambition this ring on a pair with item duplicating is the best reason why would you even want to restart the new game pluses multiple times to make your character and main pawn wear two such rings finally get 10 port crystals god what kind of a monster you can be because the riddles here are random, you may be unlucky and Ring of Ambition will be in the last chest. So for you, who long lost his luck, I'll end this uh, Sphinx quest. Before the last trial, go to the inn and make another checkpoint. Because after completing the final riddle, the Sphinx will fly away and try to disappear. And you want to kill it before that. So you might require some safe scamming. The last riddle for me is Recollection. Here you need to remember how many trials you completed. In the first location, it's 5 by default. Then just add the number of open chests you see here. So the right answer for me is 9. And I just need to bring this number of statues around pedestal and talk to this big booby lion mummy. Before the quest, I thought about enhancing my bow to the maximum, leveling up as a sorcerer for damage boost augment to ensure the quickness of Sphinx killing. But after about an hour of searching for Eldricide to enhance my bow, I gave up on this idea and kill Sphinx just like that. The main thing here is to not attack her head, but her body. First I hit the boss with right click, then fully charge Martyr's Bolt um, with all my HP and one shot the Sphinx. Giant enemies die from this attack with no chance. If you are not confident in your build and still want to secure that fight, either use Arrow of Unmaking or min max damage on your character. <clears throat> also when I replayed the fight for a footage, I discovered some sort of bug. On Magic Vacation somehow, you can't aggro Sphinx most of the times. If you aggro its Sphinx, yeah, you can damage it. But uh, before that, when you're not fighting for some reason, Sphinx ignores all your damage. Also, there's another thing I found. In some cases, even if you beat the Sphinx as magic archer, she can become offended and say that you've proven yourself wanting and just leave. So I recommend to use physical damage vocations on this boss fight, at least before devs fix those bugs. Ah, <sighs> the final part. Enhancing our magic bow to maximum. As I said before, you cannot find Eldricide before the post game. Even then, mobs that drops it uh, spawn in not too many locations. So forget about making your bow triple elven enhanced to Wormforge Dragon's Breath. Go to this isolated coliseum on the first floor. If you run around and search for ore, you'll dig up some sunstones. One instance will be enough for any Vermundian peasant human blacksmith to enhance our bow to plus two. After that, visit this cave. Kill some lightning saurians and with the freshly obtained bull strike materials go to the elves for a plus three to our bow but wait 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 don't forget to load that cave better here you probably need some parkour jumping skills but i'm telling you it's worth it you need to find a chest with a gauntleted petticoat inside that's the best chest armor for magic archer in knockdown resistance terms in the game aside from car set petticoat defenses sucks but i think for magic classes knockdown down's far more dangerous thing than the damage itself. So when there's a time, don't forget to bring this armor to dwarves for enhancements. Poise is an important thing, mark my words. So 
So, about bow. Enhance it for time with help of Dragonforged. And if you decided to play with the petticoat, uh, enhance it too. Yay! Our build is finally assembled perfectly in terms of equipment regarding augments. That doesn't really matter that much. In the first Dragon's Dogma, augments had a much bigger role in DPS, because the scaling of damage augments mostly was percentage based. But, uh, okay, here's the list of the best augments on a mage archer. Ascendancy. Because a 90 damage boost to your team is a pretty decent buff, especially if they are using enchanted weapons that damage both with magic and strength. On such pawns, this augment works with twice efficiency. Next, Asperity. That boosts the effectiveness of frost arrows, making them freeze targets better. And if your pawn imbued your weapon with fire, of course enemies will be quicker to ignite. Catalysis. Does it need explaining? The same hairy ogres and griffins will simply suffer more from fire arrows, and some magma rattlers will die quickly from the frost arrows. Even considering the augment only gives a 5% boost to a multi-thousand damage, it's a pretty decent buff. Next is Sagacity. That's the augment from the same sorcerer vocation. It gives us 30 flat damage. Exaltation is just a must-have augment almost in every build, useful both in and outside of combat. Lethality. Another 5% damage boost, but only for weak points. Considering that the same dragons have two of them, hurt in the head. Those tentacles have a millions of eyes. I think this augment is pretty useful. Keep in mind, by the way, that during aiming, the magic archer automatically selects the part of the enemy to shoot, and often it's precisely weak points. I'm not even mentioning that with Martyr's Bolt, to all enemies bigger than average, you deal damage to weak points with a 100% probability, because Martyr's Bolt damages every body part. In a 200 meters radius, a truly divine feat. Now, post game. Before going there, collect some materials to enhance late game bow that you'll get in Unmoored World. As you remember, you can loot only one material and then copy it in the forgery at the checkpoint town. For a grindmar, you'll need two dark scales. Magma rattlers from Volcanic Island, drop them. Two blackened horns from Gore Minotaurs. This hairy guys, you know. Two sinister fangs from those dogs. You can find them in Batal or at the same volcanic island. And cursed Dolahan bones. This mob can be found while you're progressing a quest till death do us part. Available after a complete bronze quest where you must visit Nameless Village. If you followed the guide and collected port crystals, you already done it. You can take death do us part quest in the high quarters of Warnworth. Some old fat dude came to speak with you about Gregor. After that, you need to speak with Gregor's wife and go to the dark forest. Before all of that, I recommend to make a tavern save before you're going to high quarters to have opportunity to load the game if Dulahan doesn't drop his bones. But if you already took the quest, don't save in a tavern or Gregor will just die. <laughs> By the way, this boss has a very little chance to randomly spawn in different locations of the game at the night time. But this chance is so small that I wouldn't count on it. Headless knights spawn steadily and in large quantities it is only in post-game. Okay, you gathered all ingredients. In an immortal world, just buy the best magic archer gear from Dragonforged. And yeah, I'll say it again, if you're not a fighter, archer, warrior or a warfarer, the best body and leg armor for you is Charming Corset, that guild gives you for 150 seekers coin. Now, post-game gear for your warrior pawn. I recommend to buy Dragon's Flight Axe from any weapon vendor. This axe has highest knockdown power in the game. For an armor, we need the highest knockdown resistance, so your choice is Dominator's armor. It's pretty expensive, but for a warrior you won't find any better. Agamemnon Galia that you can find here on the bottom of Dried River inside the chest, and the One Goddess Griefs can be found here on the map, in a chest near the dragon. So, the build is min-maxed. Only possible improve for it is to wait for a DLC. Probably there will be a new loot and all that stuff. I hope this video was useful to you. If you want more content like this, subscribe, leave a like, leave your kid, leave it all behind. Have a good day. You can see it, Maharaga! You can see my curse technique!